All right. Give me a sec, and I have one last thing here to adjust while uh, while we're getting things started here. But while we're uh, while we're doing that, I will introduce everybody. Hello, I am Legendary Neurotoxin here, bringing you live a uh, dead feature rant live every week on uh, Thursdays, 5 to 7 p.m. Pacific. This is an H1Z1 broadcast. And today I have two awesome guests with me. Over on the screen left here is Neoplasm, and over on screen right is uh, Senor Blanco 42. Now I'm gonna um, have both of them kind of talk about their their background here. But before that, I wanted to mention uh, Senor Blanco is actually someone who I got to meet at the um, uh, well at other places too but uh, he was at the H1Z1 event over at SOE campus so we got a chance to uh, talk a little bit there and get to see all the cool stuff all the the preview stuff that a lot of it's actually probably out of date now now they've changed some <laughs> of the uh, the features about the game yeah. but um, let's start with you so what's your what's your background with um, um, you know, games with SOE and um, first-person shooters and survival games and, and that sort of stuff. Oh, man. Uh, well, when it comes to SOE, I started way back with uh, with Planetside 1 and, uh, you know, played the hell out of Planetside 1, had a big group going there, uh, switched over to Star Wars, um, Star Wars Galaxy is probably my favorite crafting system ever. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, then kind of played those off and on i stepped over to wow i'm sorry it happened and then yeah, that's uh, fine then came back you know then came back as soon as i heard about planet side 2 from then just going nuts with alpha and then beta of planet side uh was it soe last year soe yeah. live last year had a great time with that um now survival games i have to say my all-time favorite game hands down has always been the very first resident evil and like that has always hooked me with the idea of that survival horror type game. Gotcha. So yeah, that's that's my stick. That's my stick. Very cool. Very cool. All right, Neoplasm. Why don't you um, talk about your background with the same sort of stuff here? Yeah. So I'm I'm fairly new actually to um, SOE games as of Landmark. And I played a bit of Planet Side 2, but not not very much. So uh, this year will be my first SOE live, actually. So I'm pretty excited about I mean, Landmark and H1Z1, especially like the emergent AI kind of stuff that they're talking about and yeah. and next. And um, I've been I've played Eve Online, so a lot of the stuff that they're talking about, sort of like the sandbox type of games, is something that I'm really looking forward to. Um, in terms of first-person shooters and survival games, I used to play a lot of Counter-Strike and uh, bought, let's see, Rust and Daisy on Steam Early Access. So nice. I'm kind of excited to see uh, what they can do with H1Z1, especially since it's like a big MMO, persistent world, and that's sort of something that you don't see with Rust um, and Daisy. Right. Cool, cool. Okay, hey, yeah, Tenma. Yeah, um, anybody who's in chat, uh, feel free to chime in anytime and say what's up. If you have any questions, any comments, or anything, um, feel free to uh, spread the word about the show. I sent out a tweet just a moment ago. Um, so we're going to be getting going here in just a moment. I have one last little modification to do. You're probably not even going to notice it. So, so did you guys um, get a chance to either watch or kind of read up on the um, the broadcast? Yeah, I actually got to catch it uh, this morning. I stayed home from work, actually. I uh, was working at home, so I was lucky enough to pop into the stream right when it started. Cool. Yeah, I just I unfortunately got to, had to work, so I got to um, read up on it, just read some of the recaps and... I really like reading Reddit, some of the uh, opinions on things that they have to say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's definitely an interesting place over there. And that's definitely the place to talk about the game right now. Uh, Smedley said himself he really prefers Reddit. They don't even have a forum for it. 
So um, that's where uh, that's where the action happens these days. If you want to talk about Reddit, or if you want to talk about H1Z1, the uh, H1Z1 Reddit is the place where you're going to get the most access to um, the devs and stuff that they're going to be talking about, short of you know Twitter and their actual broadcast themselves. Okay, so this was a pretty interesting broadcast. This was um, the 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 voice that that was narrating this was David David Kennedy, um, who he's a character that they they invented for this, who um, is kind of a, a radio journalist who's going around trying to record what's going on in the world and um, you know getting an idea of how people are getting along getting along rather in the um, um, you know in the current the the current situation as well as providing what information he has um, related to the events leading up to it yes double D and that's actually they they referred to that in the story that um, the reason why he was so so well equipped to be a survivor is because being having two names David who was called Double D as a kid and you don't want to be a fat kid named Double D and have you know big old man boobs so he uh, he was in really really impeccable shape and that that he said you know really helped him along so that was a nice little bit of um, kind of story to add in there um, so there's a lot of stuff. Uh, they talked about this Kurama phar pharmaceutical company, and there was stuff in the ticker at the bottom, as well as during the uh, many times during the broadcast itself that it was brought up. And this company was working on experimental drugs that were trying to cure basically everything. Um, and I'm sorry if 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 you guys want to say anything at any point, just you know. Feel free to feel free to chime in because I could just end up reading. I've got five pages of notes here, so <laughs> I could just end up reading for like the next two hours. <laughs> I really like that aspect of it because it, it, it. I mean, to think of another survival horror, it's very much like uh, World War Z, where the guy was constantly interviewing all the different, um, all the different survivors of it, and it, so it allows you to get the full immersion of the of what happened without feeling like there's this. Omni, you know, omni, omnipresent person that knows everything there is about the about the situation, right? And actually, it did a great job to lead us to a lot of things to look into and try to learn about over the course of the game. Uh, one thing that was actually talked about, and it was maybe a midway in, um, that was really interesting when he was talking to um, what was his name, Slick Rick Jarvis the idea that things were just abandoned, that everyone was evacuated or left on their own accord, everything was just left open, people left their cell phones, their computers, and all of that. So players might actually be able to find more information about what had happened through people's um, you know, media information and computers and stuff, plus having a stable power source and all of that. So that could be a really interesting way to reveal content and reveal potentially other places that the players can go later on. Yeah, I thought it was really well done. I was impressed that it was all like live voice acted too. I also noticed afterwards they threw up a uh, um, post on the Reddit for people to post their own survivor stories. So I think that's pretty cool. Yeah, they even have a Twitch for, uh, Twitter one for that, which is the H1Z1 twi uh, Survivor. Yeah. <laughs> Neat. Yeah, I'll have to look into that. I um, uh, So, if anybody doesn't know, there's fires going on in San Diego. SOE is, like, officially kind of closed right now. Uh, I don't even know how they did that broadcast. I'm not sure if just a few people came in or if it was all done remotely. But, um... <laughs> Come, what are you doing? <laughs> uh, I don't know how they did, but you know, it came through really, really well. I mean, that's why I thought it was pre-recorded because it sem it seemed like you know if they already had it recorded ahead of time, and they just played it. It could have seemed like it was a live, you know, live broadcast, but you know, certainly doesn't have to be. Um, and who? 
that sounded like it was Adam Clegg's voice that was doing the uh, the talking for Double D there. Did anybody else confirm that, or that's that's who it sounded like to me? I don't know. Oh. Speaking of which, there is. Uh, I wouldn't doubt it. <laughs> one of the uh, ticker messages: uh, "Clegg toilets. You can't clog a Clegg." Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so there's some really interesting stuff that was talked about before we started getting into the interviews with the different survivors. Um, so the Karama Phart Pharmaceuticals. I keep calling them pharmaceuticals. <laughs> Karama Pharmaceuticals Company was working on these experimental drugs and they were getting record profits and from the sound of it those drugs were actually working they 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 worked really well and, um you know just to to kind of summarize the entire thing not only did the drugs kind of lead to people becoming the zombies but it also appeared that the drugs actually worked and the people who weren't turned into zombies now have this miracle cure in their system that allows them to be pretty much free from illness. So that's really interesting. I'm not sure if that means anybody who dies will automatically become a zombie or if you still, if you have to be infected by somebody who didn't have a resistance to it or, you know, however that worked out. But they talked about um, this Dr. Carver who who had some research um we 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 don't really know necessarily the extent of it. He was in Italy in um an uh, island near Venice where the this this mass grave had been discovered. Now he had uh written this book apparently, The Island of Death, and it was about the island of uh Poveglia, um, which is I I guess it was like an insane asylum or something where Napoleon had all had uh sent their sent their um people who they thought were you know crazy or otherwise but um he was saying that um the it, it was kind of this um ignorant containment situation where they're just kind of housing the disease in there they weren't really doing anything for them or with them they're just kind of housing them there and that the disease kind of spread around and became this like massive super disease or something that then eventually it spread to other parts of the world um and then there was also some mention of some rotten fruit or something from Poveglia Island that was able to be used to treat illness which would explain the origin of the um you know where where the natural uh compound for the medicine actually came from um, so Karama Pharmaceuticals was the company that was uh, researching that and um, uh, that was Dr. Carver that was um, he was doing some of the research before it was it was seized and it, his uh, research was shut down by the uh, Italian government so it seems like one of those things that players are going to be trying to do during the course of the game is somehow get access to Dr. Carver's research and you know try to learn more about the infection and how it occurred and all of that just from you know from whatever information they can get from that Germany's got a hold oh yeah that's right the, that was the other thing is the um, the Germans found Poveglia and uh, they had done some research with the disease during World War II that's exactly right um, so yeah <laughs> really interesting stuff really really interesting story like the way all the stuff and how it all comes together is just done really well um so we've got a little bit more before getting into the uh, the survivor interviews to uh, to kind of go over here. Do either of you guys want to say anything in particular? Um, yeah, I thought it was really interesting, especially when they started getting to the survival stories and like how they were dropping hints and setting everything up. I thought it was uh, really well done. I actually didn't expect them to have that much um, lore or to have it be that in depth so I was I was sort of um, pretty su 
surprised in a good way. Cool, cool. And uh, Senor Blanco, I guess, um, wh what does your kind of opinion of, like, wh what have you kind of read about stuff? Um, kind of well, talking. Yeah, I think I think the, the nice part about having these uh, having the backstory like this is, I mean, without without shoving your face, making it a little more um, RP, like you're gonna, you know, it, it kind of inspires me to actually want to create a backstory for my own character, so I'm not just in there hacking and slashing, and I can play a first person shooter if I want to do that. But the nice part about this is it's like you can actually get more immersive and and almost give it. A reason to be more immersive because you have this backstory, and it, you know, done right. They they even make mention that the bigger the bigger uh, world changing events you create, the more you'll be wrapped into the lore. And I think like you know, this this is like this has that potential to be that new level of of you know player immersion and player player growing a game, not just by like look, I made a really cool town, but you know, I actually affected how the outcome of the you know the game moves. It's I think there's a lot of potential for that. Yeah, I kind of think I hope that they use this double D character to sort of like report in the future to report on like stuff the players are doing. Like maybe all of the players get together and there's some sort of event that occurs in the world. It would be kind of neat if they use the radio to like report on stuff that's happening in the game. Yeah, yeah, or the um those uh, airdrops they've talked about potentially those having um, newspapers and other yeah. sorts of media bundled along with them <laughs> pound sign <laughs> I'm not being sarcastic I am an award winning home brewer <laughs> won five awards last year <laughs> brewing is something I'd love to see but um <laughs> it it would take I mean fermented um fer fermented whatever um is pretty much what humanity had survived on for potable fluids and you know drinking water and stuff for the longest time it'd just be some amount of malt syrup with some amount of the uh white sludge from the previous batch you throw in and you know it'll start to get a little foamy on top and you can scoop that off or whatever and you drink what's there and it'll it'll be kind of nourishing, and it's not going to get you drunk, but it's going to have enough alcohol to uh, help stave off bacteria and such. So, that could be something interesting for them to include in the game, of course. If we're all immune to disease, then I could see, oh, you know, we could basically just drink, what, parasite-ridden water, and it's not going to do anything, I guess? Well, I guess that solves the problem of constantly having, you know, since you always need water... If you, if you can drink anything, no big deal. So, because purifying it, I mean, it, it, that, that's where it could go down, down like a slippery slope of like constantly menial tasks. Like, I gotta purify my water before I drink it every time. It's pretty much every camp would have a, a bucket of boiling water, <laughs> right? <laughs> For convenience sake, well, there's. I found a lot, and you know, of course, this was just uh, you know early, early, um, you know, before pre-alpha access or whatever. The and you saw it too at the uh, H1Z1 event. We yeah. saw it was a lot of water bottles, a lot of cans of beets, and a lot of water bottles in those houses. And I'm wondering if it was just because they don't have enough stuff to, you know, populate those inventories, or if we should expect to find a lot of water bottles and cans of beets and like uh, you know candy bars and protein bars and stuff like that in cupboards and cabinets throughout houses well I, I it's, it's funny like watching Lost made me realize you know th they constantly were reusing the water bottles and, and that makes total sense because that plastic is going to last forever yeah <laughs> I mean so why not yeah but see I, unfortunately I didn't find a lot of houses I found a lot of cars so when I was playing that that pre-alpha i ended up with no water and a pile of barbed wire nice. <laughs> I, so i had barbed wire everywhere <laughs> barbed wire yeah that's <laughs> but they did mention that one of the guys is like wait till you can make a landmine i'm like what he's like all right you're done but i'm like but i want to make a landmine <laughs> 
Yeah, well, I mean, I can think of all sorts of not only makeshift ways, but, you know, crude versions that existed, like a, um, uh, there was, I think, a drum barrel for uh, a machine gun in the World War II era, maybe it was even the Tommy gun, that you could put a, um, uh, what's it called, like a, a little explosive primer on it and turn it into a landmine, uh, like an anti-personnel mine, so... You know that's that's pretty interesting kind of versatile use, and it was actually designed to be uh, made you know, into mines like that. It wasn't some weird field thing they did. It was totally meant to do that. Mm-hmm. So that's uh, really neat, and you know that's the sort of stuff that it'll be interesting to see what we'll be able to do and um, what kind of weird destructive makeshift MacGyver stuff we can make hooking up car batteries and other things to stuff and uh, having things go boom when it gets tripped. Yeah. So if someone asked in the stream if you could make a Lego Hort style house. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I, I think that's like in reminiscence to, uh, I don't know if you guys played Seven Days to Die, but that was the one thing about Seven Days to Die is you could it was it was like a very semi uh, you know Minecraft version. I the the houses you know answering your question the houses that they you can, can do on there like a, you basically build collect all of it and you everything's based off of a, a ingredient list for um, crafting and then you just end up crafting the whole thing as one big piece. You don't actually have to do block by block by block. So you could you could actually trap someone in a house. You know, throw the house down and boom, there it is. Okay, so getting back to the um, the radio stuff here a little bit. There was one little pit. Now, I I was almost like just laughing the entire time because of how well this, this guy was just deflecting with the uh, executive order and how much people were theory crafting <laughs> that this was the um, uh, the release date. So, oh. yeah. Okay. So first, there is there is this um, um, Senator Robert Davidson. Um, he there 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 was a hearing of his where he he's kind of nailed, but he's able to hide behind this executive order one thirty five twenty six, and. People keep saying, you know, blah blah blah, one thirty five twenty six, and trying to say that it's uh, the thirteenth uh, of something or the twenty sixth of May or something like that. And I'm I'm just laughing like that. It's hilarious, but I'm just as much laughing at, you know, how how this um, you know trial thing or the, this uh, hearing is going on, and you know they're getting the the, the, the chairperson or whatever, she keeps getting more and more pissed off because every time she asks him something that you know is like the the thing that's going to blow the whole case wide open he's like nope nope sorry executive order 13526 I can't talk about that so what we what we kind of know from it is that US has ties to Italy as well as uh, Karama Pharmaceuticals and um at some point he took a during a tour took a flight from uh the secure DARPA facility which you know you wouldn't just be going to on a family tour and was uh flown to Venice which is you know near where the um yeah executive order 13526 um Venice is near where that uh Isle of uh Poviglia is so we know that Senator Davidson is definitely involved with uh, Karama and the whole thing. And there was some other stuff. There was this Joseph Allen Edwards, uh, who was a whistleblower. Um, he leaked some information. I can't remember the extent of it, but he uh, he kind of disappeared after that, and we we don't know any more about him. He may or may not still exist in the game. He might already be dead. There might be information of his that we can find somewhere um, 
and uh, one of the other things I spotted in the ticker was that um, there is there is something about like um, um, DC was being maybe this was a little bit later and I'm misinterpreting my notes here that DC was evacuated and that all the um, uh, government power was transferred over to the state so um, you know, at this point, everything is kind of a bit of a free-for-all in terms of uh, government and such. Um, okay, so I can uh, I can keep on going here. Was there anything else you guys wanted to say on the um, on kind of some of that stuff? Because then otherwise there's a bunch of, um, there's all the different uh, survivor stories that have a lot of interesting details in them. Uh, yeah, well, the only thing I think I have to add is I think I saw people were saying in chat, like, they, they were theory, the theory was it was like uh, May 26th in 2013 and the, and the uh, infection was a year later so that they were theorizing that it was May 26th was the release date. Hmm. Smedley already posted, already <laughs> tweeted about that, and said that is not the official release date. <laughs> Stop it! He's like, and he says, I don't know where you guys got that. Like, oh. <laughs> I don't know where. Like some people like rearranged. I saw someone rearranged all the numbers and like had it add up to three, and then they were like Half Life Three confirmed. So, oh my know. god! Yeah. <laughs> it ends up being the lost numbers. Yeah. Like yeah. No. It um. There were a lot of viewers, and let me tell you, it was not really worth it to to look at chat for the most part. <laughs> it was only for the laughs because it it had so much like rabid fanboy that just doesn't know what the hell is going on going <laughs> with it, and it's just it was hilarious. On thirty five twenty six, refers to classification classified top secret the release of information that points toward NASA security yep so you know clearly they didn't make it up it was um, that that was what was being referenced the entire time he was able to use that to pretty much deflect every single question during that hearing um, so all we learned was from what was being asked of him and then him deflecting it again because he's, he's not under any obligation to answer anything <laughs> that was another thing I liked is that the um, Paveglia and the executive order are like actual things. I looked them up, and yeah, I liked that that they like didn't make some stuff up. They actually put a lot of thought into it. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Radar X is the person he didn't. From what I understand, he didn't necessarily write the lore, but he kind of discovered it. So I'm not sure um, what that necessarily means, but he. Um, He's definitely somebody who, who is very knowledgeable about what's going on with the story. And for what I remember, there was some reference to, um, you know, the, I think this was last week, Clegg was saying in one of the, the interviews about um, people going in Smed's office and having like five hour <laughs> meetings, like trying to hammer out the story and the lore. So they're working really hard on this right now. And it's good to actually have this stuff. Um, solidified now um, sooner than later because it's really going to affect the design decisions like the uh, the piles of rusty cars in the middle of the road that we saw during the um, the demos not only does that that not make sense in 15 years because a modern car can sit out for 15 years and not be completely destroyed on the exterior the interior is probably going to be toast but you know the exterior can still have some points that are in pretty decent shape and still be salvageable on the inside um, so that's probably going to have to change. I don't think there's going to be intersections full of rusted out cars. There might still be intersections full of cars that are, um, you know, non-functioning or maybe they don't have any gas and they've been looted for parts already. Um, but if someone was actually using those as a roadblock or a barricade, they would position those cars in a way that's a lot more meaningful and then probably take the tires off. Um. Uh, 
Well, I think that'll be an interesting. They're gonna have to be really careful with where, where, how far out they make the the um, timeline start because realistically, like under a year, you're looking. There's still gonna be access to a lot of stuff. I mean, you'll have access to a lot of. I mean, realistically, there is a lot of bullets out there, and it doesn't take much to reload a bullet. So yeah. they have they have to put it far enough out that it seems plausible that you're not going to find as many guns and weapons as there should be, but not too far out that, you know, people like there's, you know, it's completely desolate. So it's, yeah, that, that they're going to have to really make that perfect. I mean, especially cause there's so much, the, you know, the biggest thing, the perfect example of people like gleaning any possibility of release date off of it. People do all the research. They know how long things, you know, like you said, 15, 15 years isn't enough time for it to, you know, rust out, but then how quickly things deteriorate, they've got to be really key about that. Otherwise, you're going to lose some immersion in mm-hmm. that. Yeah, yeah. So, um, and that was one of the other things, is there was one of the uh, survivors that uh, Double Deed met. He thought the girl was maybe 16. She said she was 12. Um, you know, just out there surviving on her own. So we don't really know, um, you know, how long this has been going, how old, like, the youngest um, survivors and stuff are actually going to be. But it should be really interesting. Like, she she had a gun, and she apparently had no problem finding um, food and shelter and ammunition and stuff. Um, So, yeah, it it should be really interesting to see that kind of... And then the other thing about the distribution is that, um... Uh, they've talked about the southern and eastern edges being where the players spawn from, so the northern and western is most likely where the better equipment and the tougher encounters are going to be. Yeah. So I haven't seen any. I haven't seen any word on how big the areas are, are supposed to be. I know oh. they keep talking all our planet side uh, it, islands, but. It sounds like it's going to expand over time. I think they're going to be splitting the difference between Planet Side 2 and Landmark. That Landmark will eventually have large, sprawling spaces, I believe, or at least EverQuest Next definitely will. And as a testing ground for those kind of seamless worlds, they have to do it somewhere. So I think H1Z1 is going to be kind of the testing platform for, you know, big, sprawling worlds. Because they said, yeah, you're going to be able to go further and further as they continue growing and developing the game and adding more to it. So we might start in this square here, and then as the game increases and goes along, it keeps getting bigger and bigger. Still towards the uh, southern and eastern edge is going to be the safer territory, but the further, uh, you know, uh, I guess the further north along the eastern edge and the further west along the southern edge that you go, it's also going to kind of scale difficulty out in those directions. So it should be a really interesting way for the game to grow and continue uh, developing. And the area that he's talked about, he was saying, you know, you don't, you're not really going to be able to cover a few miles. Uh, thanks for the follow, by the way. Uh, you're not going to be able to cover more than a few miles uh, a day because you've got to be really silent. Um, so, so mobility and how far you're going to get is pretty limited. Eight kilometers. Um, just being able to run eight kilometers, start a character, run that distance, plus or minus stopping to to get food and stuff, uh, is not the sort of thing that I think people are going to be able to do very successfully. Um, Sneak, we do not have a release date, unfortunately. However, they have hinted at uh, early access coming pretty soon. I would say, if nothing else, we will know the answer at or before E3. Um, and I'm going to actually be at E3, so I'll try to get any information if they don't reveal it otherwise. Um, it's a well, good question, I, though. And, and I think they've also, uh, I mean, it's, it's really interesting how much they've, even from when you and I played it, I think they've really ramped up the sensitivity of the zombies. Cause oh, yeah. When we were playing, I mean, you could get, you could get, you know, 50 you know, a good hundred feet from a zombie, and it still wouldn't even pay attention to you. And from everything I've read, they've they've ramped it up to a level of like, you know, it it comes. They come after everything now. Yeah. So. And that was actually one of the really interesting things with the runners and their story. Uh, the character Raton was talking about how there were these um, baby dolls that would make a crying sound, 
and those would just draw all of the zombies to it so that was actually what they would use as decoys is they would have these really loud um, baby crying sound things that they would uh, you know deploy them out in the field and uh, wait a few minutes and pretty much the next few neighborhoods in the area would all have all their zombies swarming on this one central location so they could go wherever else they needed to in the city and be pretty much alone so yeah they're gonna hone in on sound and apparently the sound of a crying baby is something they especially honed in on so that should Which is be creepy as hell. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> and you know, it could be really, really effective. You know, you hear yeah. you hear a crying baby. You know, someone's using a zombie decoy somewhere, <laughs> and yeah, don't be right. near it because they're coming towards you too. <laughs> Which adds a whole new level of PvP. Yeah. Damn. Now that just makes me think the 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 worst crying baby sound in any game I would ever played, potentially before H one Z one was. Um, Super Mario World 2, Yoshi's Island. That damn crying yo uh, uh, Mario baby was just terrible. I don't know if either of you guys played that game, if anybody in chat remembers that, but... Ah, oh, it was horrible. So that... This will be a different kind of traumatizing crying baby sound. You hear it, you know, <laughs> the zombie's coming. Get the hell out of there. Or find where it's coming from and chuck it somewhere far away. <laughs> which is how they kind of figured it out the first time. Cool. All right. So, um with one more incident that they talked about before we started getting into the survivor stories. Um Grace Mercy Hospital was evacuated by for some biological ha hazard. The staff was all evacuated, but security told everybody to leave the patients. Then the military comes in through the police barricade, says they want all civs out of a one-click radius, and there's gunshots. So you just imagine, well, that hospital is probably killed by, by military gunfire. You know, everybody that was in there, all the patients. Um, now this is somewhere where they um, had a... Um, an outbreak actually happened. It was uh, uh, an incident. Um, the, the some incident in the morgue apparently, where somebody had. Uh, uh, wait, am I am I getting my stories mixed up, or was that uh, the that Doctor Charles that I'm thinking of? Do you remember Neil? The uh, the morgue incident. Morgan said, um, I think, I don't think you're getting them mixed up. I think that was the Grace Mercy yeah, Hospital with yeah, the, I think uh, so. the woman. Okay. So yeah, is that a, um, no, no, it was Charles because he had just finished the, um, uh, you know, trying to save that woman who had come through. Um, so yeah, we'll we'll talk about that in just a moment. But I think that was the hospital. There was there was definitely a lot of I could tell interconnected characters going on at least in the earlier part of the broadcast. Um, so yeah, I mean that's that's definitely there. It it starts showing that there was some knowledge of these outbreaks happening, or as the knowledge started coming about. Um, something started coming around, you know, the, the, the military at all was starting to try to uh, take care of it and silence it, and apparently either they failed or they've changed their efforts to doing the uh, airdrops or whatever and containing a perimeter because uh, at this point there aren't, you know, big military transports going around everywhere blasting zombies and, and securing, um, you know, remaining survivors or anything. Um, and, you know, that's the other thing is uh, you don't necessarily want to see military. Uh, one of the dead, uh, when they they came across military uh, in that film, um, the idea was that military was going to round up all the civilians and turn them into pretty much their slave workers. Um, 
So, you know, just just because they've got, you know, tanks and assault rifles and they're looking to kill zombies doesn't necessarily mean they have you in their best interest either. Um, so that's a really interesting uh, uh, thing to consider with it. But once again, it's kind of understood, at least uh, to us at this point, that you know everybody who is a survivor, they're not getting ill anymore because the effects of the uh, Karama Pharmaceuticals has um, you know they they weren't affected by it or um, immune to the the zombie effect that being uh, exposed to a dose of it would apparently cause. Baby's cry can reach 97 decibels uh, pneumatic drill. That's pretty close to an airplane if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> yeah, that's so uh, yeah, I could see that being um Hell, I could see fireworks, like those really long sustaining fireworks, uh, the, the screamers and stuff being really useful for um, just a quick draw to, to get the hell away. Because I don't know if Story Bricks will have different levels of um, uh, being able to, um, you know, prioritize maybe Zombie A. They prioritize audio versus scent. Zombie B prioritizes scent over everything else. Pri uh, zombie C requires motion and they'll hone in on that. So that could be another factor of it. Only some of them can be drawn off and some of them the only reason why you get the entire horde is because they're following the smell of each other and they're following the movement of each other. But as soon as you do something to kind of rattle them and give them something else to target some of them might break away. Um... Pound yeah, that'll be that'll be interesting if they see that if we see different styles of zombies like that because they were saying like scent's going to be based off of heat si heat signature not not so much off of uh, actual you know O factor so it'll be interesting to to see that that work out too if they if they really create zombies that have different you know different uh, characteristics to follow after different people that'll really make it complicated yeah. means you'd have to have different kinds of lures you'd have to have a um what tie a um well i think even a firework like you said fireworks would be amazing well they, they don't they produce sound and they produce high heat which would be you know that's that's a dual purpose right there i'm trying to think of what would be the best like um having a uh, uh a boombox tied to a uh, a bear or something and and <laughs> you know having that as a lure <laughs> i think that's a that's a mini quest in itself <laughs> being able to tie it to a bear <laughs> <laughs> well you know you got to feed it some some meat with some sedatives in it and work from there <laughs> Until cool the bear turns into a zombie and then you're really screwed <laughs> You know, Diggs, so I, that's that's interesting. Having like just s basically styrofoam armor, that would be interesting. I was thinking that, like, you know, even like where you wrap, you know, wrap a telephone book around your arm uh, <laughs> and yeah. you know, duct tape it to your arm. But then the problem is, is that going to slow down? And that's yeah. that'll be interesting to see how will they take into because they're really focusing on melee uh, as well. And I remember showing like the different moves and stuff like that. Yeah, being able to is it going to slow down you know, if you're wearing armor? Hopefully, it will. You know, in greatly decrease your ability to, you know, move and swing and. Yeah, uh, Neo, we cut you off there. What were you gonna say? Oh, uh, I think uh, I was gonna mention that I watched the like the twelve-hour dev stream. I think they mentioned like tying a piece of meat to a grenade and like having the zombies like <laughs> approach it and then blow nice. up. Nice. That sounds like, like fun. A meat mine. <laughs> but I kind of like because they said so like you could either up. cook the meat or you could like decide well there's a bunch of zombies out there I'm hungry I'm going to take my chances and tie this to a grenade and toss it out there so yeah. well, I mean that actually adds a lot of interesting play too with even like clothing you know if you found a wetsuit uh, you know it's going to inhibit the, the heat signature a lot the little things like that would 
would definitely change up the uh, your game style. And you could go like full stealth. And but if you wear that during the summer, you're going to cook from the inside. Right, right. <laughs> and, and I, but that, but if I mean, the the question is, how immersive are they going to make that? I mean, you could go crazy with it. Yeah. No pound sign. Why would you put it on the blade? You put it on the the part in the middle, so that way they try to get close to the middle and it doesn't fly off when it starts spinning. Gosh, you gotta you gotta think these things through. You gotta be a survivor here. <laughs> We're not making comedy. We're not making meat missiles. Which is kind of centrifugal force sending shredded right, anytime, meat anytime everywhere. Anytime you see lawnmower, I think of uh, what was that movie? Um, Oh God! Evil, not Evil Dead. Um, there was another movie that the guy like it was one of those Tramaville films, and it was like the guy used a lawnmower to hack everything apart in the house. Nice. <laughs> oh, and that was one of the funny parts in one of the. Um, uh, I can't remember if it was just uh, our narr- narrator Double D there talking about his stuff, or if it was somebody's uh, interview in particular. But seeing somebody with just uh, uh, basically a zombie wearing a full suit of medieval plate armor, just kind of wiggling like a turtle on the ground because it couldn't really get up. <laughs> so it had this heavy-ass armor on. Had no coordination. <laughs> so... <laughs> that, um... That, not only is that hilarious... Yeah, because he, he was talking about uh, zombies that, that... You know, people who are trying to be prepared for the zombie apocalypse and... You know, a lot of zombies that just have backpacks full of supplies because either they're trying to survive and they got killed at some point or they got infected because they weren't able to resist the effects of the uh, the the Karama medication or whatever. And, you know, they were just kind of out there. Though the infection sounded like it spread really quickly. It was... Um, and I'm going to get to that here in just a moment with um, the uh, Dr. Charles and his stuff. Because that was um, that was kind of some pretty interesting stuff for like the timing of how everything happens. Um, but the the zombie virus apparently happens pretty quickly. I like the idea of slowing a zombie down. You know, yeah, like a, uh, a a, conc- a fast drying concrete slinger. <laughs> <laughs> well, apparently, you can just uh, potentially kick him in the leg. Um, but then they're crawling in the grass and you can't see them. <laughs> yeah, no, that was the um, that was the story of the um, the guy who was running the um, uh, what's it called? The not the runners, but the caravan. Uh, Rick Slick was it? Or something? No, no, no. The caravan was. Um, Oh, uh, I've got his name here somewhere. Hayshaker. Hayshaker was his name. Uh, Donald Michael, I believe. That he was, uh, he was kind of sick. He had a stomach flu. Then he, he, he gets some, someone knocking at the door, or something knocking at the door. He goes to see what it is, and it's this big old, you know, fat guy with no face. So he freaks the hell out, kicks his kneecap in, um... And then gets back in his uh, his big old Cummings diesel truck and slowly drives his way through the horde of zombies. And from that point on, uh, where, where we meet him in the story, he's actually got some modifications to his giant truck, including a big old cow catcher on the front. So, it's totally awesome. Um, but he's, he's a little bit later on... Um, did anybody... Oh, yeah, Hayshaker Jr., that's right. Um, and they've talked about being able to attack body locations on zombies and players alike and potentially being able to wound them in that way. Um, so that very well plays into it, and I really like the idea that instead of just having the... Um, what was it? The Q button for that push ability where you just push the zombie away that you would have a different key press that you could use or maybe it's a targeted ability for like a stomp kick sort of thing so you can actually smash the leg in if you just need to get one out of the way or use it to block the way for some of the other ones behind alright yes he did drop the junior that is correct 
<laughs> okay, so you can talk about um so there was this Dr. Charles. I didn't catch his last name. Did anybody get that? I it sounded like it glitched out. I thought I heard like Orochi or something like that. But I don't know. Uh, if anybody could get a confirmation on that last name, that'd be great. Um, he was a resident ER doctor at the, um, uh, you know, the the local um, hospital. I think it was actually a Grace Mercy Hospital, but I don't remember if he actually said Dr. Charlie. He says his last name once well, at the beginning of the interview, but it kind of glitched out for me at that point, so I didn't quite catch it. Um, he had reported um, people coming in with multiple puncture wounds, mangled fingers. Uh, they would have thirst and like flu-like symptoms. It was a real quick onset. They would call that stage one. Um, oh no, stage stage one was I believe just kind of coming in and you know have, having the issues, and then stage two was the um, the the disease and stuff. Then stage three, they they pretty much that's when they were getting into the necrotic state and starting to become a zombie. Um, he he was theorizing that the desire to eat is more about propagation. They don't actually sit there and feast on corpses. They don't appear to actually eat. Um, but apparently that they're pretty adept at repelling uh, natural scavengers. Um, so, yeah, we, we, we had learned about the incident from him that, um, he had finished trying to save somebody, um, and they, um, turned into a zombie afterward. And I unfortunately didn't write down... I thought I had written down the name of the... Oh yeah, Sarah Evans. Uh, uh, 30, 34 year old had um, uh, come in and that was the person who he found was animate after you know death. He wasn't sure. He thought, well, maybe we had missed something. Maybe the person's actually alive because they even went into surgical procedures and, you know, they got ambushed. He didn't get bit or anything, but he... Um, you know they 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 managed to contain, and then there was there was mention of a Sarah later on that um, uh, the the character uh, Big Mama or Mama or whatever um, with the caravan, who I think was one of those interconnected characters that um, the neighbor of this character we meet later. Um, so. Anyway, um, so after that is the caravan, which is um, one, two, three, uh, three different interviews. So before I get into those, did you guys have anything in particular that you wanted to say or talk about, you folks in the um, uh, folks in chat there? Uh, have anything you want to say? Any questions? No. You guys are kind of quiet over there. <laughs> um, I guess, um, w what did you guys kind of think about the, um, you know, how, how that stuff was kind of revealed? Because this was, this was kind of the first person that we meet, um, like, when the outbreak has actually gone on, when it's actually been, you know, known that there is an outbreak. Ooh, uh, D David David Kennedy or yeah yeah how you know this is this is the first person that he meets that David Kennedy meets when he uh, uh, you know kind of starts oh, the doing doctor? this thing yeah the doctor is the the one who he meets yeah um I thought it was pretty interesting that they yeah. I mean he started like with the the hospital and meeting the doctor where the origin of the thing and then having like I like that they were little recordings and he had been carrying his tape recorder around and interviewing people. So 
but it was nice how they revealed it that way. Gotcha. Uh, Senior Blanco, anything? No, I mean, I just, I, I, I don't really have anything to add. You guys have been getting it all. Gotcha. Cool, cool. Okay, and I saw a, um, a ticker at this point about Pawtucket res residents being evacuated to uh, Big Bend Park. I don't know. I didn't follow the ticker to see anything else about that one. I shot voxels. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, so, yeah. Hayshaker, Donald Michael. That's who we meet um, next. And he's kind of the, uh, the, the, the leader, or at least the lead truck for the caravan, which is kind of this mobile group of survivors that I guess they drive around and, um, he'll, he'll, he'll drive in first with his truck to clear the horde and then the rest of the people behind will, uh, clear any other, other, uh, zombies that are still standing afterward, so... They've kind of got their life set up. They know what they're doing. They're pretty much, uh, I guess, going from place to place, looting gasoline or have some way to produce it or however. But that's uh, that's pretty much their way of life is drive around, smash zombies. I'm sure we'll see a later iteration of that where you're able to uh, actually create biodiesel and power. I mean, it's so it's fairly easy nowadays to be able to create it, so I could definitely see them adding that later on once they add more vehicles and, you know right now they've only had that jeep but uh, their plans are to have more so cool to see that. <laughs> which could which could turn very mad max in the yeah place. for sure i mean the um uh, team rts kind of uh survival -y game um what was it dead dead zone the last stand it was uh on congregate and i can't remember where before that kind of fun game gasoline was like the major the major currency in fact that was actually the cash currency if you if you spent money on the game you would get uh if i remember correctly gasoline that you could then use to buy other things or you could actually build a gas generator in game but it would break down after it completed making gasoline so it was real resource intensive but you could produce your own and it could be used to uh speed up missions acquire things all sorts of stuff trade with people, I think, if I'm not mistaken. Um. Have they said anything about how um, that will work in the game with the vehicles? The gasoline? Like, will it be a really rare thing? And you'll just... Will you be able to craft it? Or do you have to go and find it, basically? And it's, like, you can only go a certain distance before you run out and have to walk? I well, certainly there's going to be... A they said there's going to be a lot of a lot of maintenance required. Like, yeah. even if you found a vehicle that's full of gas, you know the spark plugs may be dead, and you got to find you know find spare spark plugs and and all that. And I, you know, I haven't seen anything on like your ability to know how to do that. It will be interesting. Right. You know, I think they're going to. I don't know how intuitive they're going to make it or. No. Yeah, like one thing I liked about how they revealed the survivor stories is like I kind of like while I was listening to it, I was thinking like, oh, these are roles that like players in the game could assume, and like maybe people will want to start up a caravan and like go and find these resources because I mean this is stuff you'll need to gather, um, you'll need to maintain your caravan, you'll need to like find gasoline and supplies to keep going. Yeah. Now, they could also add it as something, you know, procedurally with other things that are being uh, given to players or to loot in the world. Thanks for the follow, H1Z1 Jane. H1Z1 Jane, by the way, is apparently a, uh, a, a stalker that I've picked up because they, uh, they, they think I'm delicious and really like my scream. My H1Z1 scream. Oh my so. god. They <laughs> I'm still not sure if there's someone that actually works at SOE or if it's just somebody who's a uh, uh, a fan of the game. But you know, maybe I'll find out at SOE Live. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I haven't really done that much research into the subject. Um, but what I was gonna say is the um where we can find um, food and water and stuff and it can procedurally 
replenish over time if we go away and come back and you know some things can you know randomly appear in them if we'll have the same thing with gas stations and gas tanks and abandoned cars if you know you come to a car one day and there's no gasoline you come back uh, two weeks later and check it with the tube and sure enough there's some gasoline for you to siphon out um, now there could also be people that are you know anti-vehicularists that are just going around putting sugar in every gas tank they find <laughs> <laughs> which would be horrible <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I think the the interesting part of what that was brought up is you know I've, I've seen that whole thing about how you know procedurally generated amount of certain items you know it almost makes you not want to move on if you find an area that, you know you can go back and reloot and reloot every day so they're gonna have to be really careful about not not uh ramping that up too high because otherwise people will just stick in one spot where there's a pile of cars knowing that these things are just gonna keep reproducing yeah. themselves. Yeah. I wonder if you'll be able to like siph like sneak into a camp and siphon off like people's gas like with their vehicles. Yeah, power. if you can if you can <laughs> perform that level of sneakiness, do it. Mm. You get that gasoline. <laughs> Perhaps. <Huh? laughs> yeah. So. Um. And, you know, other than that and being able to potentially manufacture it and, um, you know, supply shelves and stuff that we might be able to find it. Um, and then the other thing is how much variation they're going to have. Are they going to have, you know, hybrid cars? Are they going to have, you know, just gas, just diesel? Are they going to have actual differences? Is there going to be, you know, the potential to make biodiesel or those diesel cars where you just need the diesel itself to start it up and then you have a second tank that's running on fry oil because if that's the case you just go from fast food place to fast food place and you've got your um, your fuel supply secure um, but I think they're not going to spawn things while players are in an area if you're in a settlement if you've established a settlement you've taken it over you and your buddies have taken this little 30, 30 house strip of a town little know nothing whatever in the middle of nowhere you build walls around it you've made it your own little civilization stuff is probably not going to be spawning there anymore oh, um great. you know and that's that is great i'm that's that's how it should be you should actually have to go out and uh um salvage can you fry zombies i wouldn't eat a zombie you can try it digs i'm not gonna <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> that was the question. Hit once one person had posted, you know, is cannibalism going to be allowed? And <laughs> and the the big question was, is it? Would the, the, that purely is just should we allow it? That's that, that's pretty much what the dev said. They're like, ah, we don't know if we're even allowed that because that could be a whole different level of you know, that could turn into uh, almost where like the more people you eat, the the more evil or not necessarily evil, but the more like unhumanistic you become so but you've got to eat their hearts to gain their courage and eat their brains to gain their knowledge don't you know yeah. you know that's how it works <laughs> <laughs> that'll be the last time I hang out with you <laughs> <laughs> alright so yeah um, continuing along with this story there was not only a, a thing on the ticker about the I-95 <laughs> being closed in North Carolina and then Mercy West Hospital being closed. Um, but I saw something about nuclear nuclear explosion in India, Pakistan declares aggression. Or the Pakistan uh, claims aggression, rather. So... This isn't just going on in Ohio or wherever the game takes place. There's stuff going on all around throughout the world. For all we know, there's some war going on. There was also another thing on a ticker about riots in Cairo, tens of thousands dead. Um, just the ticker alone, I think, if I had the feet of that, that would be something to talk about. Yellow Springs, Ohio, bombed by military. Um, yeah. That was, that was a little bit later on. Um, so there's, there's, there is stuff going on 
everywhere. You live really close to I-99? <laughs> oh no, Tenma. <laughs> 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 yeah, no, there's there's stuff going on everywhere. You know, United States, Italy, you know, obviously what we were seeing in, um, uh, um, uh, with the, the nuclear explosion in India and Pakistan, that's, that's I'm sure, going to be a huge deal of its own, and um, I don't know, maybe there's going to be Maybe maybe that's opening the door for radiation mutant zombies way, way, way later on or something. I don't... I really don't know. Um, yeah, it'll be interesting to be able to find out how much... how much of even just the U.S. has been compromised. You know, like, one of the dickers was that, you know, Texas closed its borders. Yeah. Are there any states that have, have learned how to completely isolate themselves... Right, right, and that'll be um, it'll be interesting when we we'll actually get to start getting around in the world, because um, it sounds like it's going to be you know multiple servers, but they're going to be the same content plus or minus on each one, other than what players have done to add or remove from the world. H one C one chain. I bet you do. <laughs> Most survivors live on the East Coast. Good to know. Oh, and I think that senator was from New York, by the way. Uh, yeah, he was. <laughs> Walk to D.C. from San Diego if you got the balls. If you got the balls, the guns, the food, the materials, the luck. <laughs> yeah, it'll be interesting to see how they do like the first borders. No, I mean obviously they're not going to do an entire United States. So how are they going to create a border without making it a, a fence or just a huge swarm of zombies? You know, it's gonna what's going to stop you from keep on running one direction? By the way, folks, um, if you wanted to help contribute to the uh, situation going on in San Diego right now, not not talking about something in the zombie game like real life wildfires going on in San Diego right now the offices are closed for you can click that uh, tiny URL out there Omid's going to be donating to the um, I think it was a National Firefighters Association I think it says there in the link uh, no, association it's the relief fire, uh, fire relief fund that's the one um, they've already raised thousands of dollars uh, I think we're you know over two thousand now um, uh, maybe potentially going to keep on streaming through until SOE offices open up. So, if you want to help contribute, uh, he's going to be signing off a check and sending it along to them. You know, soon soon as we can. Anyway, um, but I guess the reason why I was why, why I was thinking about that, and it's kind of a weird thing. There was a fire tornado. There was a picture of a fire tornado going on. Now, um, at one point in, um, and this is a little bit later on, um, Double D finds himself running for cover when it starts with the heavy rain. Like, you know, ignore, ignore all other things, first find shelter. And, um, you know, rain being that big of an impact, especially because, you know, he's got his recorder, I'm sure he doesn't want to get that to get uh, any more damaged and beaten up than it already is. Okay, something happening interesting in DC tomorrow. Oh, interesting H one Z one Jane. Did the military shut access across uh out of Manhattan? I think I think you were right. I don't remember yeah. was that on the ticker or was that one Yeah, it was the, on the ticker. Okay. Yeah, they showed they showed that they had shut down all the all the ac traffic and access to the island. Gotcha. Was that, I can't remember, did they say that's where uh, Kurama uh, Pharmaceuticals is actually located? Or did they actually say where that was? Because I don't remember. Oh well. Um, I didn't catch the location, but there was a top brass brewery. Um, think of something about, like, strong enough to get a dwarf drunk. <laughs> so fun little promo stuff that they were kind of sticking in there. 
That was where the virus strain was found? Okay. Manhattan shut down, sounds like a Will Smith movie. Oh, damn it. <laughs> okay. Um, so, yeah. The one other thing that was really funny about... Um, uh, what was it? A haystacker? It was a Hayshaker, excuse me. Uh, <laughs> haystacker. Uh, I was going to call him Haymaker at first. It's like, wait a minute, that doesn't sound right. Um, he loved just terrible frozen burritos. And the rationale wasn't, you know, specifically that he enjoys burritos. But at, having been a trucker, he used to miss the good old days of sitting around a crappy truck stop um, waiting for the microwave to heat up their burrito. It's still cold on the inside, but being able to jab with the other um, uh, uh, truckers there, just, you know, shoot the breeze, uh, and, you know, trade handles and all of that stuff, and um, that that's the thing that he said he misses about, uh, um, you know, what civilization used to be like, um, but I don't know. He seemed he seemed to be pretty happy ramming zombies with his big old diesel truck with a cow catcher on front. So, um, you know, he's he's one of the people they showed kind of made a, a place for themselves in the world. <laughs> Terrible frozen. <laughs> <That's> so wrong. <laughs> yeah, Maybe that I, was the actual zombie outbreak right there. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that would explain why he had the stomach bug or whatever and was laid out for the <laughs> the, the very beginning of his story. <laughs> Gross. <laughs> All right. Oh, Throck. <laughs> okay. Oh, that's so wrong. <laughs> So, uh, we we move on then to um, uh, Krista Phillips was the uh, the character uh, Mama was her name. I thought it was Big Mama at first. Mama was the name, um, and uh, she was uh, 26 years old. She watches over the uh, the kids in the um, um, uh, what's it called in the the caravan. And what had happened was she she. Um, when the outbreak occurred, she drove with her husband to get the hell away, and, you know, she was a former housewife. She didn't, you know, doesn't really have much in the way of survival skills for the most part. Um, so, um, at, at some point in their escape, they, well, they hit the neighbor, um, uh, the name Sarah comes up for the neighbor, and that's why I was putting two and two together that they were you know, interconnected characters that Sarah had, I guess, um, is either, that was, I guess it was probably after she had escaped from the, um, um, the, the hospital where the military had gone in, so I guess the military, you know, broke containment and got taken out or whatever when they went in there, or they just had some escapees. Ah, uh, thanks for that one, H1Z1, Jane. Yeah. I was reading that one earlier. <laughs> um, so yeah, it was a uh, kind of a tragic story. She, uh, her, her husband uh, saved her from a zombie, but got infected, so she kind of locked him out, and uh, then got really drunk and tried to uh, do away with her three-month baby, or three-month pregnancy rather, um, which is really terrible. And, um, let's see. Um, then I think, I can't remember if it was, like, that day or shortly after. That was when the caravan found her. Um, you know, took her in, cleaned her up, and put her in charge of the kids. So, you know, that's a really sad story. But it was really well to, uh, they did a really good job weaving that in. And, um, that's, you know, kind of the, the tragedy or whatever of, um, and she says why she doesn't like to be called mama is that, you know, 
she had that incident. So, um, did you guys want to say anything about that? Anybody in the uh, chat room? Otherwise, Big Reg is the uh, the next interesting character that we get to hear about. I mean, it just goes back to what I said earlier. I really, I really love how they have these stories because I don't know. It, it almost kind of feels like it's a, a great way of, of creating people, people against zombies instead of just a, a, a bad, a big slugfest of PvP kill on site. People will be more willing to like, oh, this person is is trying to survive just like us, so we don't don't kill them right off the bat. But you know, then there's going to be people that just want to jump on and grief the hell out of people <laughs> yeah, yeah so we should buy it <laughs> a rude no <laughs> yeah now the 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 way they put everything together I and mean, that one you know the 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 fact that they 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 went the range with you know you've got someone who knows what's going on somebody who didn't necessarily know what was going on, but was prepared. And now we had someone that, you know, found out what was going on and totally wasn't prepared. And then we get on to the next one, Big Reg. He's the chef for the caravan. He he can make you know a sufficient you know regular burrito. He can't make a frozen burrito, but you know be an extra chore to try to freeze it anyway. <laughs> um. R what was it, Reginald uh, Harvey Williams? And he was he's 37. Um, a short person. The reason why he was given the name Big Reg is actually really funny. His actually his whole story is actually really kind of interesting and kind of funny. So, uh, kind of short guy. Uh, he would get pranked a lot at the restaurant that he would work at. He was at a restaurant in uh, Billa Fontaine, Ohio, I believe. Um, th that was about the time that they were saying about the riots going on in Cairo and the ticker. Um. So, short guy, he gets pranked a lot. He got stuck kind of in the storeroom. And the more, you know, he, he was getting teased about it, that the, the storeroom, because it had kind of a janky door to it, it only opens from the outside. So he got locked in there because they kind of use it as a hangout room, break room. Um, and the guy on the outside who kicked the door out, or the doorstop out, he's laughing. The more Reg is in there, like, getting pissed off and trying to open it, the more the guy's laughing at him. And then there's a really loud sound, and um, you know the uh, you know there's some shuffling going on, and uh, the 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 firearm uh, goes off. The the one that they keep to um, I guess protect or take care of people trying to rob them or whatever goes off once, and that's it. Um, and they don't explain if you know if that was someone taking their own life or trying to shoot zombies and being overwhelmed or how that worked out but there was just silence after that so he stayed really really quiet with all the shuffling going around he actually was in the dark for three weeks because the power was basically out um so he had all the supplies to eat out of or whatever all the all the food and water and booze and everything um I heard finally after a while he started hearing some scratching and stuff outside again. Heard someone trying to get in, so he grabs two biggest cast iron pans. Sees he, you know, he thinks it's a zombie. He doesn't realize zombies can't open doors, so uh, afraid for his life. Uh, as soon as the door opens, he comes out swinging them like mad. Catches the guy in the head who um, who who opened the door, and. Um, uh, the guy, a big dude, you know, just kicks him right back in and, and closes the door. So he's locked back into the, uh, <laughs> back in the storeroom. <laughs> and they, uh, the, the, uh, guy goes back to the caravan talking about this dude who's like seven foot tall and, you know, big beefy guy came out screaming and swinging. And so, you know, they come in, uh, telling them to stand down and everything. When they finally open it up, sure enough, it's just this little dude in there with a couple frying pans. Um, and knowing how to cook, he joins them. Um, and that's pretty much, that. that's pretty much his story. Um... It's kind of entertaining, and it kind of shows... Yeah, thick skull on that guy. That's seriously, like... That's more than just a concussion. Most people, that's, uh... Some serious damage there. Sounds like a tasty character. 
awesome. Alright. <sighs> so he'll be know, interesting, interesting if we can find some of these uh find some of these NPCs out there. You know, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, or at least, you know, because someone already posted on Reddit, like, so-and-so is deceased, so-and-so is deceased. How do you know they're deceased? We have no idea. These yeah. love stories are just, you know, based off of what would be interesting to see. I mean, I know they're not necessarily looking for NPCs yet, but it'd be great I'm just sure. to find remnants of it. I'm sure players will assume the roles as well. Someone's going to want to go take the story and run with it, too. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, the um, and that's the thing I'm wondering is will we actually see NPCs or if we see any representations of any of these groups or any groups in in general, um, are they going to be all SOE uh, players or you know that could be something where SOE actually gets the um, you know people from the community involved in a special way is they'll have a group of 20 people or something they'll, they'll select and be like hey we want you guys to uh you know be a part of this event you know we'll we'll give you some some time on a little private area to practice doing whatever it is we're going to be doing so you can be really proficient at it and then when we go into the uh, the live servers you're going to be basically representing the, a group of npcs plus or minus but you're actually real players actual real characters and you know don't if, if people actually start trying to attack you guys feel free to let loose on them but um you know definitely play to the um the kind of the storyline for these characters because i think that's definitely something they could do um and potentially have players be put into these roles thanks corndog 103 actually be put into these roles and being able to play um the part of these characters or um, characters that are created specifically for that server to represent, you know, the the current group of who's in the caravan at that point in time. Well, I think you even nailed it. Like, you know, it could be an RP server that, you know, that if you join that server, the goal is you have to assume a role of a certain, one of the characters, almost like they have a character selection screen that, you know, you don't just pick, you pick a runner or you pick a caravan, you know, person. So you're constantly that that's your goal that's your role or you know even part of that militia 23 where your you know your goal is to be to act and and do what that group would do that would, i mean that could really that oh my god the level of the craziness that that could cause well even having um rival factions um created in that way and actually having uh battles going on between player organizations that you know they're going to fight to their fullest because all of their stuff was given to them by SOE, and they know uh, because there's this special event going on, they're going to be spawned 50 meters away with full equipment rather than at the edge with nothing if they die because they're part of this special event going on. So that could be a really fun sort of thing too that they can have where you know by the end of it there's this bloodbath and you know whoever whoever the the survivors manage to uh team up with afterwards they can either share the spoils or potentially be um you know threatened afterwards hey we don't need you guys we can take your supplies too <laughs> you know well there was there was even talk about the potential of you know later on bringing it in where people play actual zombies yeah so that um, would be a lot of fun the the different levels of that you know it's like what was it what was it the uh Xbox game uh, oh my gosh I can't even think of it Left 4 Dead I think it was where you could actually play a zombie or play a, a specialized zombie so yeah. it'd be interesting to see how they're going to roll that out if they're going to allow for people to play NPC play you know because so I mean it's so much fun to theory graph this but there's so many different ways they could do yeah. this but it's all about how much money they want to put into this <laughs> honestly if they let us play as zombies, I'm probably going to be just playing as a zombie the entire time as much as they'll <laughs> let us. <laughs> because I will I will be that one that I, I've gotten really good, and this is from playing, um, uh, what was the game, Hidden in Plain Sight. I had played it a few times, different times, and it's a game where you're trying your very best, at, in, at least in one of the modes, to blend in with the other NPCs and try to make yourself not look like the other NP, you know, the other the players in the field. 
So from that and other sorts of things, I can I can do a pretty convincing zombie shuffle. And yeah, whatever. If I get killed, I'll come back as a zombie. I don't really care. I'm not trying to, you know, it, if my kill count gets reset, whatever. But at the same time, if I can manage to shuffle my way in, you know, to somebody who's trying to do some crafting and you know grab him from behind and bite him in the head two times. I win. <laughs> that means we're actually. I'm gonna actually have to rebind the walk button that I never used in any game. <laughs> oh, I use it in Landmark all the time. Use that with the uh, the tribal dance command. You do that really fun like strut forward and backward. <laughs> it's really funny. <laughs> yeah, or the the drunken stagger is another one. Already walk like a zombie. Aren't even drunk yet. <laughs> No, but you're the guy that got hit in the head with the frying pan. <laughs> that can't be good for the equilibrium. How? <laughs> Although oh. a cast iron frying pan would be amazing as a weapon. Oh I mean, yeah. You could hit you could hit so well on someone's head. It's a big enough size. And it's not too hard to swing one. It's gotta get a little too close. You know, it probably gets better over time. The more you use it and the more it gets warped, it'll give you some different edges and stuff to work with. True. So that, I'm gonna send that to SOE right now. I want, to, I want one of the weapons to be a cast iron frying pan. Oh, I'm sure after <laughs> after this broadcast, I'm sure that's something that they're already planning for. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, cast iron pan. <laughs> so that was it for the um, the people we get to meet from the uh, the. Um, caravan. Now, Double D could have easily just stayed with them. They liked him. But, he didn't. He decided, well, I could, you know, stay with this group, but I'd rather keep going around and try to find other people. So the next group he meets isn't as friendly. It's, um, I think it was like the, the forest near the Chattahoochee River where they found this next group. It was the, uh, Dale Edwards was it the the something twenty third militia or just the twenty third militia? Yeah. He named the group. So this this guy was like you know total um, you know military head. They had already planned for this sort of stuff. They already had uh, a fence to to have as a perimeter, snipers and everything. They claimed could uh, could take people out um, at a moment's notice if you needed to cameras and stuff everywhere take pictures of people to make sure there aren't uh, the same people lurking and snooping around um, talk of bandits in the area that you know look don't put your weapons down boy so I'll have you wearing your skin as a suit in no time or something like that so this this kind of shows the um, I guess not necessarily antagonistic side of uh, other players but the the very much like we don't trust you we don't trust anybody get the hell out of here types that I'm sure we're going to see especially it sounds like they were pretty well prepared ahead of time so you know the, this is probably a group that already knew what they were doing and have probably been surviving together like this plus or minus um, the entire time I definitely think the the very first day one of uh, H1Z1 will be I'd like to see the kill count between zombies and other players. <laughs> I still trees. I, trees I are the other one. Oh, and trees. I played the <laughs> game. That little bit of playing the game, I killed the same person and like three other people. I, I, I was like, I always like, went into this game going, I'm not gonna kill anybody. That's messed up. I'm going after zombies, and I just see someone run, I chop them down. I'm like, oh my god, I'm a dick. But uh, yeah, it was pretty awesome. So I definitely think the count at the beginning is going to be insanely high of people killing each other. I mean, just accidentally killing your friend. I think I accidentally sent someone standing next to me on fire. I was like, oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, that fire is, like, really unforgiving. You just stand something, stand near something with your torch out and it lights on fire. Or likewise, you get, get too close to a, a burning hobo barrel and you light on fire. That, that one kind of struck me as odd. Like, you'd think the player has enough common or the character has enough common sense that it doesn't you know lean his clothes and his belly and everything into the fire and and get caught on fire but uh i don't know if we'll actually um have that level of you know lighting lighting on fire from proximity or not when uh things get fine-tuned a little bit more i watched someone on the stream right over there and was beating on beating on a, a barrel of gas <laughs> with 
<laughs> That's not the best approach. Yeah, I mean, you can you can do that in Doom and make a pretty green explosion and take some damage and ha ha oh, the barrels explode, but it's, you know, this is a zombie survival game. It's not the same kind of thing. I mean, I guess there's there's going to be uh not only like Ten was saying the first two weeks of Waterfest, the first two weeks, even first two months is going to be just like constant Darwin awards, like people finding out all the ways <laughs> they can be killed and die and <laughs> stupid things that can happen that can lead to their demise one way or another. I think not just the first two weeks, but the first two months is going to be a whole lot, especially because they're going to be continually retuning and uh, fine-tuning systems. There could even be a bug at some point where, like, no matter what you do, your your uh, food never replenishes or something. So everybody, you know, you're only gonna live for eight hours or something, no matter those what. Are be, those are gonna be the best YouTube videos of people yeah. putting it together, like montages of stupid deaths. I think we should start a Darwin Award evening where we show really bad deaths. <laughs> yes. H one Z one Darwin Awards. Yes, yes, yes. I mean, that's, what was the the game, 30 seconds to die, 60 seconds to die, where you're just in an office building trying to find all the different ways to kill yourself or whatever? <laughs> <laughs> I never played that, but that sounds amazing. Don't ways to die, H1Z1, yeah, seriously. <laughs> Dumb ways to die, and you know that's good. It's going to be a thing. There's probably going to be people trying to one up each other. Like, so I'm sure there's going to be someone who's going to try to build, um, uh, I don't know, like a glider or something, and just to just to crash it into some other building, causing an explosion. <laughs> you know, I mean, hell, Adam Clegg might just do that anyway. <laughs> <laughs> he will definitely clay it up. I'm yeah. no doubt about that. <laughs> Any, put put him in anything that flies, and you're expecting a spectacular crash. <laughs> That'll be the special event. Clay can fly in the galaxy. Look out! Racing off his chairs on fire. Sure. <laughs> 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 Why not? <laughs> Yeah, I'm sure there's going to be plenty of stupid ways to die, and of course, you know, walking up to the fence of a settlement that there's NPCs who just kill on sight. That'd be kind of silly. <laughs> the Clegg Olympics. Um, but I'm really, I'm really wondering um, if there are actually going to be true NPCs in the game or not, because right now Forge Light Engine does not have a scrap of AI on it. Other than the, you know, meager vaporware that we've seen for, um, EQ Next at uh, SOE Live, the or not vaporware necessarily because it is on the Forge Light engine, but you know it's it's just like the most rudimentary. This thing can go here and swing this weapon. There isn't like a health or a damage system necessarily. It's just it takes this many hits to die because we're doing a visual demonstration of the engine. We don't really have any true AI that we've seen up until this point for the Forge Light engine. So well, I think a lot of that's coming into the way the zombies are going to react and act because the goal for EQ Next is to have it so, you know, if you kill a bunch of goblins in a certain area, those goblins vacate the area but then repopulate in another area or um, I, I'm sure they're going to start bringing that into the zombies that like certain zombies know, or not necessarily sentience, but the idea of them moving into an area because they know that, you know, People commonly use roads. You'll probably see them start to hover more around roads. I think yeah. that that's really the goal. Or yeah. like the likes and dislikes. Yeah, things like that. Or like gravitating towards large. I think um, I saw they mentioned something like if you have a big fortress or if you build up a big area that like it'll attract more attention and you'll see more zombies come out and try and uh, take take your stuff. <laughs> Well, yeah, I, I think even we're talking about how that uh, even proximity chat, because I mean, I'm sure they're bringing in just like a planet side oh, yeah. to talk. The louder you speak, and if they can actually make it work, the louder you speak over over the um, VOP, uh, was over IP, that it'll actually cause more zombies to come your way. And there, was yeah. a, there was that great scene from, from uh, Walking Dead when the helicopter flew over and that horde of zombies just spun the other direction and started walking. <laughs> So, 
Um. Yeah, well, that's the thing, Diggs. They don't have memory, so it's basically like a computer running with just RAM and no uh, no hard drive. It's just got all of its base processes running, and that's all it's doing. And all Storybooks has to process for them is their own individual needs at that time. Um, if they desire to try to infect you or if they desire to stay with their do stand where they are and do nothing... You know, that's that story bricks taking its action, but not on the level of EverQuest Next where it's all they want to do right at that moment on top of everything that's happened in the world involving you and involving them up to that point. Um, so we're seeing, you know, a real easy early version where stuff isn't going to have the same kind of reverberations. Probably more with actual NPCs, and if we actually do have, like, um, you know, player character equivalent NPCs out in the world, like these characters that we're meeting, that uh, Double D is meeting. Um, you know, that'll that'll be a really interesting thing, not only to see what uh, NPC interactions are going to actually be like, you know, intelligent NPC interactions are going to be like in the Forgelight engine, but also really giving us a, um, you know, a, a, a different set of rules to kind of think about, because NPCs that are on the level of a player they've got their motivations but you can't just be like hey blah 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 I'm so and so you know you can just trust me um, they're not gonna care that I'm legendary neurotoxin um, they'll shoot me anyway <laughs> um, but once again if I'm playing as a zombie then you know they'll, they'll shoot me anyway <laughs> I'm gonna be expecting it at that point so I've got to be more stealthy than just walking up to the front gate and asking for an interview. <laughs> I also kind of wonder if the zombies will be interacting with the uh, wildlife, or if the like if if they could scare like a popular like some some areas. If there's too many zombies, they could scare off like all of well, the deer, and you'd okay. be hard to find food. Or that was somebody's favorite thing from the H1Z1 demo was a deer being chased by a wolf being chased by a zombie. <laughs> so yes, there will be those interactions. Now in this broadcast, they were very very good about not talking about animals at all yeah, at all animals they were not a thing they were not mentioned they were not referenced the only sort of um you know skin pelt or hide or anything that was ever mentioned was double d's in case you know he hung around that uh, uh chattahoochee area too long and the bandits got him <laughs> which you know i guess maybe they're uh Maybe they are cannibals. Um, well, they did say on, uh, I think I was reading one of the PC Gamer interviews, that they got uh, some play tests and they said that, you know, you leave it, you turn your torch on to keep the wolves away, but if you, keep, you turn your torch on, the zombies find you. So if you turn your <laughs> torch off, the wolf gets you. So it's, I mean, they're showing that, like, even the predatoryness, the predatory, like, levels of the animals are, is going to be much, seem like much more heightened. Like, they're out to eat whatever they're going to eat. <laughs> no, I just imagine, like, maybe, uh, uh, Homer Simpson or, or Philip J. Fry just sitting there with a light switch that they they turn it off and then they <laughs> scream and then they turn it back on and then they scream because the things that they see when they turn it on and off keep changing. So you just flick, ah, flick, ah, flick, ah, flick, ah. <laughs> you know, the, once again, one of those funny ways to die or stupid ways to die is like you just sit there trying to weigh your options until one of them picks for you. <laughs> it would be interesting. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say it would be interesting to see how, like, the zombies react to things like rain or, or if they behave differently at night than they do during the day. Yeah. Yeah, and they are they're actually probably gonna interact differently. Like the ones that are scent based, they're not gonna be able to smell like the rain is gonna suppress all of that, so uh they'll have to use other things and temperature again, that'll be you know, they'll be they'll be detecting heat in different ways because the cold rain is gonna be everywhere. So they might actually have increased uh heat detection in those situations. Or maybe if they're closer they'll hone in on it better, but if they're further away it gets muted by the uh by the rainfall. So, speaking of rain, and I should probably say we've got another 20 minutes to go here, so I kind of want to go through some of the rest of these survivor stories and just kind of talk about them real quick. Um, so, he ran for shelter when the rain started, 
and that was the one that 16 year old or he thought he, she was 16 she was 12 um, who had taken over uh, some, taking shelter in a restaurant and she apparently uh, knows how to use firearms pretty well and can she doesn't really even care if it's a human or a zombie anymore if it's coming at her she just doesn't want to have to deal with it so she'll kill him <laughs> so uh, he was lucky he didn't get killed here and uh, had to bribe her with uh, candy bars apparently to to get her to agree to doing some sort of an interview. Her parents were killed or whatever, and uh, um, of all of them, I would say she was like the least rounded character of all of them. She seemed like the most like simple and contrived, and and uh, almost seemed like a character who was written out of a book d uh, designed for twelve year olds. So. <laughs> You know, it uh, that that character and that story just kind of made me feel a little bit weird in general. Um, typical girl. <laughs> uh, then uh, later we see this uh, fella, John Colin Hodge or Jack, the sheriff or whatever of this Ohio settlement. He'd been a criminal and an alcoholic. He'd been locked up at some point. And when the sheriff slash jailer came for him at some point, he was a zombie and wasn't coming to, you know, take him out or, or do anything other than try to eat his flesh like a zombie. So he apparently pissed his pants and passed out, maybe not in that order. Uh, and when he wakes back up, um, sheriff Z jailer zombie guy is pushing his, has actually pushed his head through the bars and is reaching through. Um, he said like the the skull had to have been smashed up because the 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 zombie's eyes were like poking out towards the side because it was so smashed. But it it just sat there trying to push its way through. So he um, you know when he got himself out of that situation, um, I think he just like kicked him in the head and just splattered. Um, when he when he got out of that situation, he kind of realized, well, you know, things are completely different now, and uh, it kind of became like a reformed man at that point, and um, that was when we uh, the, the that's when he kind of became like the this protector of the people type. Um, that was also when we saw in the ticker about DC being evacuated state government's in control, and then the thing about Yellow Springs, Ohio being bombed by the military. I don't know where Yellow Springs, Ohio necessarily was in relationship to the uh, settlement that uh, Jack was uh, kind of running there. So either they just got bombed or it was somewhere near there potentially, or maybe not. I don't necessarily remember it. I uh, can't remember exactly where the location was. Um, and then there was someone else at that settlement, um, she was saying, you know, she's the, the cause of the zombie outbreak, and she said, well, you know, not necessarily me, uh, individually, but she had, like, horrible allergies to everything, uh, Karama started doing, um, medicine trials in her area, so they got the approval for it, and she, she started taking the pills, and, well, she was cured of everything, dust wasn't making her sneeze, grass wasn't laying her out for two weeks or anything. So she was curious. So these drugs actually did work. And after this interview, Double D realizes, you know, since the outbreak, I haven't gotten sick either. So that's where we start to see from, from Aaron McGuire's story. She was saying about, you know, this medicine actually does work for some people. But we don't know, is this medicine associated with the zombie outbreak? Is it separate from the outbreak? Um, you know, how does that actually, uh... <laughs> yeah. Why don't you, uh, why don't you try that again there? <laughs> Maybe put it in a short link, please. <laughs> like a, a tiny URL or something. Um... So we don't really know what you know, Karama is somehow involved with the outbreak, we're pretty sure, and they're definitely involved with this medication. We don't know if the two are related, if one is supposed to be a cure for the other. Um, really no idea. I guess it's somehow how you can respawn back into your character, because you're not actually getting infected when you get bit. 
So maybe we're all carrying the same, the same, you know, cure slash disease, but it only affects, you know, a, a obviously a large portion, but there's, you know, a smaller portion that, you know, it's kind of like Captain Trips from, uh, from the stand. I mean, it's, you know, there's a handful, handful of survivors and uh, everybody else had the, because they were immune. Yeah, Throckmorton chemtrails, exactly. They don't. He doesn't say that he actually did take those medicine that, that medicine at any point. So there is a good chance that it was just spread about and permeated um, in in some areas. Maybe it was, you know, once again, uh, blah blah blah, government, military, conspiracies, stuff, blah blah, whatever. I don't know. <laughs> they um, there's th that sort of stuff. Maybe will be revealed in a later broadcast. Hopefully it will. Hopefully they'll talk about the animals a bit too, because we didn't hear anything about them. Advanced without worrying about disease, yeah. But also, you know, we don't know what kind of disease. Once again, like burrowing parasites, does it work on those too, or yeah, we don't really know necessarily the nature of the medication either. Like what how it was formed, how it works, uh, how it's delivered, and all of that stuff. Um, so then we get on to the runners, and I've got um, uh, three, basically three more stories to go through here, and I'll try to get through them here pretty quickly. So, uh, Raton, or Romeo, as he, as he was to the ladies, he would say, is apparently that's, uh, that's his thing. Um, so he claims that he can get you anything. Um, they're really just out there to try to help people. He's got like this, um, you know, su super stereotypical uh, Hispanic kind of accent going on. It's like he he, he sounds like he'd be hanging out with uh, Cheech Marin, and <laughs> that that was kind of the thing. Some people were saying, "Is this racist?" And I, I wanted to tell them in chat, but chat was in slow mode and going to by anyway. No, you know, I actually know a lot of people. I actually played Planet Side for a long time with someone who talked basically exactly like that. So uh, <laughs> I can't, you know, it, I, I can't say it's necessarily a stereotype because I totally know him. <laughs> uh, but he was the one who was saying about the uh, the baby dolls uh, when they were hitting this. Um, uh, I think it was an elementary school for supplies. Uh, one of them tripped over this baby doll and started crying, so he threw it outside, and all the zombies flocked to it. So they had their tech person, tech, um, fix them up and make them into these basically, what he said, look like glow, uh, pretty much disco balls that produce the the baby's crying sound really, really loud. Um, and that's what they were using as those zombie lures. They would just deploy a couple of those in the uh, neighborhood. All the zombies for a pretty de decent distance would flock to them. And then whatever stores or um, you know places that they're trying to get stuff from, they could just go in and they would be left alone. Um, so that's something really cool, you know. And he was—that was the one who was saying about the crying sound of the zombie, or the crying sound of the baby dolls was apparently the perfect lure that zombies really honed in on it. So uh, I'm sure that'll be something that we'll be able to find in the game as well. A lot of the stuff that they talked about, like the frying pans and those baby dolls and stuff, I'm sure those are things that we're going to see over the course of the game. So the one uh, who we meet uh, now, uh, he. Raton also says to get him a new um, tape recorder because the one he's got is all beat up. Uh, the double D has, so he says go go talk to our uh, person tech and she'll uh, she she does all the repair work with the runners and she was saying yeah you know I uh, fix up all sorts of electronics I've always been doing that sort of stuff and apparently has all sorts of parts and equipment and just gives them a tape recorder. Um, and this was the the interview with her or whatever. He doesn't have all the information because he didn't realize, uh, or in the story he was saying, didn't realize that she was, um, or that the, the conversation was being recorded, but he had found it anyway. And he had said something about um, afterwards, um, the, the runners had apparently been attacked by bandits, and uh, they pretty much killed everybody and took everything they wanted. So... 
whether or not there are still the runners out there or that's the sort of thing that players would have to take up on their own if they want to try to do uh that's beyond us but there's definitely you know vile bandits out there who are just you know only in it for themselves and survival um and then the last one here um <clears throat> No, we, we we go from like Ohio to wherever the runners were all the way to Nashville and Tennessee. Um, this decked out luxury camper. Um, this was kind of hilarious. This slick Rick Jarvis fella. Uh, he was collecting gold and jewelry and he was gloating about how he had uh, two million and hundred dollar bills in this mattress in the back of his uh, vehicle and um, it was just so proud of having all of this awesome gold and loot and everything that he acquired. And he said, no, I'm not a... Oh, and he called it the Bone Bus. This guy was uh, 32, by the way. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, dude was saying about how uh, the, uh, the, the military or someone will fix this and everything will eventually be all good again. And that's why he's stockpiling money and valuables and stuff because when when things eventually normalize then he'll be a rich dog and oh yeah he didn't steal these things these things were left behind doors were being left open and you know stores and everything were abandoned so he's not looting them he's just taking what people left is how he justified it he said that he uh didn't want to trade an eighteen thousand dollar price tag necklace gold and diamond that he gave to double d to some guy he had met uh previously um the uh the guy had tried to um trade him for a sandwich and and uh slick rick has said hell, hell no i'm not gonna trade this is an eighteen thousand dollar necklace i'm not gonna trade it for a pb and j you know, once again, this guy is really dense, not quite understanding, like, gold and, and value and stuff. Like, gold itself, for being able to use for electronics, that's great, but trying to use it as a luxury item, an actual, like, you know, U.S. dollar bills and trying to use those, that's not going to work. Nobody cares about, you got a whole bunch of toilet paper and, like, you know, circuit making material. Other than that, diamond, I'm sure you could use that for uh, useful glass cutters and stuff. Um, it's just, you know, that character was absolutely hilarious. So he was pretty much the, the last one that they talked about. And then, um, the, the voice of, I think it was Adam Clegg, but I really don't know who was narrating for Double D, kind of talks about, you know, um, I, I can't remember if he said there's going to be future broadcasts, but it's saying about, uh, no, there's other people out there, you're not alone, blah, 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 there's other survivors, blah, 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 you know keep up hope and all that stuff so uh, and that they're going to be potentially rebroadcasting it every six hours and adding any new information if they have it I don't know if they're doing another rebroadcast every six hours it probably would be going on right now um, or would have uh, wrapped up pretty recently during the show here um, so <laughs> well the neat yeah. part about that is it brings in it brings in all of us players into feeling like we're even part of it more like you know, because you start to build your persona now of the character you're going to be. Right. All right. So we've got uh, just a few more minutes here. Uh, I've been talking almost the entire time. I feel bad. I kind of want to have you guys come on another show here uh, sometime in the future because <laughs> I, I, I just kind of read for most of the past two hours there. I mean, it's, it, I, f I feel like it was good stuff, but at the same time, it was a two-hour broadcast. Somebody could just as easily have watched that. So not, not to say that you guys didn't have a lot of great feedback and the folks in chat didn't because you all really did but I, I feel like I was just nose in the notes the entire time here. So I do apologize if you know, if anybody feels that way about it. But otherwise, yeah, kick-ass broadcast! <laughs> I like uh, at the end of the Slick Rick, he gave the story, he gave him his roll Oh yeah, he gave he him that training it for a for sandwich. A <laughs> <laughs> yeah! <laughs> like a couple days later, I traded it for a sandwich. Because yeah, it was totally worth it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, like, a timekeeper is probably useful if you don't have access to, you know, our modern clocks and broadcasts and everything. Mm -hmm. 
Well, it'll be, I mean, I sure, once we start to see, now that they're starting to ramp it up, we're going to see more and more from the game. It, it'll be good. Uh, can't wait to see what they're going to launch V3. Yeah. Yeah. You know, there, oh yeah, insane. When is when is E three? Like when does it start? June fourteenth through seventeenth, I believe. Oh, is it so, that late? Yeah. Well, it, it's usually it's been in June for the past uh, couple of years now, if I'm not mistaken. So yeah, it's um, it should be great. And from what I understand, SOE is not going to have its own specific booth, but they're going to be split up amongst um, three three booths of other vendors. They will have a uh, a media area, so if you're a media person, you can probably arrange to meet with them. Uh, I might use the uh, the event thing to see if I can get an interview with somebody and um, you know hit them up for questions and stuff. But um, yeah. It's um, it should be really good. We should get a lot of information uh, shown off and revealed. Hopefully, uh, at or before E3, we'll have the early access date revealed to us, um, and that should be a lot of fun. I would I would ex almost expect them to try to get uh, early access going before E3, so that way they can have people log in on the live servers with all the players. Right. Um, Ten through twelfth. Thanks, thanks, Paramus. Uh, yeah, they're putting it. They're putting it on a Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Those are some yeah. interesting dates. That's normally when they have it. Uh, it's a lot easier to book things for parties and events during the week instead of versus weekends. You know, Los Angeles is a pretty busy place. I mean, <laughs> yeah, Senor Blanco, you know. We're, well, I've, I've, I went to E <laughs> three. I went to E three in nineteen. Dating myself, but nineteen ninety five. Oh, okay. So it was. Uh, I think that was a weekend one. I, don't know if, well, I can't remember now, but that's when back when you got bags of swag. <laughs> yeah, it was uh, industry only. Oh, yeah. it's crazy. All right, so let's uh, let's hit this last question here. This little this one question here, and then we'll um, uh, wrap it up. Random question: H one Z one probably be M. No, it will not have nudity. The most you'll be able to remove clothes from your character is getting them down to the very base clothes. They will not go any more naked than that. You will not see, you know, hairy chests or shaven or otherwise. I don't think you'll see people's legs unless they actually have shorts that they've picked up, like some cargo shorts with a bunch of pockets. Otherwise, I wouldn't see why anybody would want to have, you know, compromise having um, jeans and a, and a, you know, nice thick shirt. Um, you, it's a lot of wilderness and stuff to get through. You don't want to be going through that with shorts. You know, not, not. I guess not everybody has the, um, the luck and pathfinding skills of uh, uh, Steve Irwin when it comes to getting through uh, rough terrain with short shorts on. <laughs> but, um, no, I don't think there's going to be nudity. There's not going to be. It's not going to be a sausage fest. There's not going to be a bunch of. And as uh, we talked about this on uh, last week's show, it's if they did something like that, we would hope there'd be some variation. It isn't just the same junk you see everywhere. Um, but I think that's one of the reasons why they're not going to have nudity because there's already enough stuff that you need to, um, you know, draw the variation from character to character that you don't need to also have to consider their. Um, you know, their junk and what's beneath the clothes there. It's just one extra set of stuff to have to deal with. <laughs> yeah, I don't think we're going to see zombie junk. I'm pretty sure that stuff will be rotted off. Um, the doctor was even saying about having had to remove somebody's genitals in the emergency room at some point. So, you know, <laughs> crotchless zombies. Crotchless zombies with assless chaps. I think that's an expansion. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, folks. So we're in the last um, few seconds here. So um, this has been H1Z1 Dead Feature Rant. I am your host, Legendary Neurotoxin. On screen left here is uh, Neoplasm. Now he's somebody who you should be following because he's a streamer. Senior Blanco, I think. Were you also going to be streaming recently, or pretty soon? Oh uh, yeah, right now just a little bit of planet side, but definitely okay. going to be doing H one Z one. Yeah, so follow these guys and uh, be checking around. They're going to be here in the community. So uh, that's it. Thank you very much, folks. Thank you for coming. Thank you, everyone in chat.
Alright, and I will see you later. Signing off in 3, 2,